Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar in the Public Health Webinar Series on Blood Disorders. This webinar is presented by the Division of Blood Disorders at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as CDC. I'm Dr. Gary Raskob and I serve as Dean and Regents Professor in the College of Public Health at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. I'm pleased to be with you as moderator today for our presentation on assessing the risk of venous thromboembolism in hospitalized medical patients, being presented by Dr. Alex Baropoulos, Professor of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few points and helpful hints. First, uh, you have joined the webinar using your microphone and speakers by default. If you would prefer to join by telephone, click on telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in dial -in information will be displayed. If the phone option is chosen, the webinar control panel will provide you with the phone and access number and the audio pin. The, all audio will be muted. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions. To submit a written question to Dr. Sparopoulos, uh, please use the questions area of your control panel. And then uh, we will be sure to have Dr. Sparopoulos respond to as many questions as time allows. The webinar today will last about one hour. Please note that this webinar will be recorded. Um, and we will begin the webinar today first with an audio poll, uh, audience poll, I'm sorry. We're, we're interested in knowing more about you. And so at this time, we'd like to, uh, you to indicate uh, your primary professional role. You should see on your screen the question. give you one second to vote on that. Um, so I hope everyone has had a chance to respond. Um, thank you for participating in the poll so that we can learn more about the audience and, and um, gauge this to uh, improving our future webinars. Now um, my pleasure to introduce our presenter, uh, Dr. Alex Spiropoulos. Dr. Spiropoulos is Professor of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine and the System Director of Anticoagulation and Clinical Thrombosis Services at Northwell Health. Uh, he is a recognized authority on risk assessment of venous thromboembolism, a major contributor to the science and literature in this field, and it's truly a pleasure to have you uh, present to us today. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, please begin. Thank you very much, Dr. Raskov, for uh, this generous introduction, and hello, everyone. Uh, we will be discussing today, I think, a, a very interesting uh, and recently evolving topic within the general sphere of venous thromboembolic or, or VTE prevention in hospitalized patient populations, uh, namely an individualized uh, VTE risk assessment strategy in the hospitalized medical uh, patient population. And I think you'll see that uh, there uh, have been some recent and interesting constructs on how uh, we can go about an individualized risk assessment scheme in this difficult, uh, complex, and heterogeneous patient population. So let's go ahead and, and begin. And I think it's important to understand the scope of this problem in, in the hospitalized medical patient population. In the US alone, there's an estimated 8 million acutely ill hospitalized medical patients. And that number is likely higher in other parts of the world, such as the European Union. There continues to be a significant unmet medical need for VT prevention in this population. We know that 75% of all VT events and about 70 to 80 fatal uh, VT events occur in the acutely ill uh, medical patient uh, group. We also know that the rate of symptomatic VTE more than doubles over the first 21 days post-hospital discharge and importantly is associated uh, with a five-fold increased risk of fatal events within the first month of post-hospital discharge. And I think the last point uh, that we are recently realizing is that the shortened hospital length of stay, both in the US and also in other parts of the world, has truly dampened the treatment effect of in-hospital thromboprophylaxis. Uh, 
and that recent data suggests that a universal thromboprophylactic approach such as been done to date without uh, an individualized risk assessment strategy may not lead to reduced VTE burden in this patient population. So this slide, I think, is an important slide to conceptualize the three periods of VTE risk in the medically ill. The first period is during a patient's acute hospitalization, which represents the highest risk period. In this period, VTE is tied to immobility, which is in itself tied to disease severity. And we think that about 20 to 40 percent of the hospitalized acutely ill uh, uh, patient population uh, would have a very high risk uh, that would warrant, uh, again, a thromboprophylactic strategy with pharmacologic agents. However, this means that likely about 60 percent to upwards of 70 percent of hospitalized medical patients may indeed be at low risk for VTE, and this is data that we'll be sharing later on during this presentation, um, and that we indeed may be overprophylaxing this low risk group. The second period is the extended or post-hospital discharge period, which can occur up to 45 to 50 days after hospital discharge. And this still represents a high-risk period where uh, the risk of VTE is tied to this post-hospital discharge period. And we think approximately 10 to 20 percent of the entire cohort of medically ill patients falls under this category. And again, I'll be sharing some data to uh, suggest who these patient groups uh, may be. And lastly, there's a small percentage of the uh, acute, uh, of the uh, medically ill uh, patient groups that due to their chronic uh, medical illness uh, uh, may need long-term primary uh, thromboprophylaxis. And here, the chronic VTE risk is tied to the uh, medical conditions such as uh, a severe congestive heart failure that, that is chronic. Important to note that the overall VTE risk in the medically ill patient group is both tied to patient-related or intrinsic risk factors as well as disease-specific or extrinsic risk factors for VTE. Now, approximately a decade ago, we had a very basic understanding of uh, what were the VTE risk factors in this patient population. We knew, we knew that certain risk factors were associated with higher risk of disease, and other risk factors probable or uh, lower risk of disease. We also know that these risk factors, as I mentioned earlier, included both patient-specific risk factors, such as advanced age, family history of VTE, uh, and history of uh, VTE that's personal, but also disease specific risk factors or acute medical illnesses, such as superimposed acute infection, uh, acute on chronic lung disease, uh, acute on chronic heart disease, acute inflammatory disease, and so forth. And what we used to do a decade ago is simply add up all of these risk factors with the thought that increasing numbers of risk factors produce an increasing risk of disease. But this is a very uh, basic approach, and what we didn't know was how each of these individualized risk factors were weighted and how these weights uh, interacted to give an overall VT risk profile for a particular patient. The other thing that we've learned by recent epidemiologic data is that VT risk extends uh, far beyond the uh, acute hospital period and that uh, these epidemiologic studies suggest that this VT risk extends upwards of 30 and up to 45 to 50 days after the post-hospital, after the index hospitalization. And we can appreciate here uh, that there are uh, uh, events that accrue up to 30 days and importantly up to about 45 to 50 days uh, post-discharge, after which these events seem to plateau out. So that this VT risk is indeed tied not just to the acute hospitalization, but the post-hospital discharge period. Now, the landmark trials of uh, inpatient thromboprophylaxis were published approximately 12 to 15 years ago. And the inclusion criteria for all of these trials, which included the Medinox, Prevent, and Artemis trial, all comparing either loam liquid heparin or the pentasaccharide fondoparinux to placebo in these patient groups, had very similar inclusion criteria uh, in uh, their uh, uh, the trial groups. Patients 
had to be over 40 years of age, they had to have an acute medical illness such as congestive heart failure, acute respiratory failure, uh, septic sh uh, 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 sepsis, rheumatologic disorders, uh, etc. And then they also had to have additional VT risk factors such as advanced age, presence of cancer, previous VTE, and obesity, etc. Now given this overall patient profile, these uh, inpatient thromboprophylactic trials were successful and what we saw using surgums was anywhere from about a 50 to 60 percent risk reduction in VTE risk with either loam liquid heparin based or fondoparinux based thromboprophylactic strategies. But we must remember that this was the time when the average length of stay in these patient populations was anywhere from about 7 to 14 days, a length of stay that we no longer see uh, in these patient groups. Now what have we learned uh, since these landmark uh, inpatient thromboprophylactic trials? Well, we know that from a VT perspective, uh, the medically ill population is extremely heterogeneous. And in unselected populations, the rates of symptomatic VTE in hospitalized medical patients can vary anywhere from about 0.1, 0.2% all the way to 2% uh, or over depending on the uh, length of follow-up period. So this represents an extremely heterogeneous group with respect to uh, VTE. The other, I think, important concept that has grown since the publication of the inpatient uh, thromboprophylactic trials is that thromboprophylaxis does not confer the same risk reduction for all patient profiles. And some patient groups, such as those with cancer, uh, such as those with obesity, appear to be more resistant to the effects of thromboprophylaxis than other groups. Whereas patients with other criteria, such as those with chronic respiratory or heart failure, appear to me more sensitive to the effects of thromboprophylaxis compared to other groups. So even the effects of thromboprophylaxis appear to be heterogeneous uh, across this population. And lastly, and I think very importantly, an emerging uh, topic is the fact that the burden of VTE in this population is shifting to the post-hospital discharge setting. In a large international registry, the improved registry of over 15,000 patients in 50 sites from North South America, Europe, and Australasia, we saw that over half of all VT events were in the post-discharge period, and indeed the median time for all VT events was 17 days. We also saw from the study that a minority of patients received post-discharge prophylaxis, only about 8% or so. In a more recent study, uh, of a U.S. Hospital Performance Consortium for VTE looking at 35 Michigan area hospitals from 2011 and 2012, a full 85 percent of VT events occurred in the post-discharge period. Indeed, another large retrospective analysis of over 140,000 medically ill patients found that the mean length of stay was approximately 4.4 days using recent data. And again, much like the previous studies, a small minority of patients under 4% received post-discharge thromboprophylaxis. And because it was this shifting of burden of VTE to the post-discharge setting, uh, again, somewhat being tied to decreasing length of hospitalization for this patient group, that three large uh, extended thromboprophylactic studies were conducted in the past five years or so. The EXCLAIM, Magellan, and ADOPT study comprising of over 20,000 patients. The EXCLAIM study compared the loam liquid heparin and exaparin to placebo. Magellan compared the direct factor 10A inhibitor rivaroxaban to placebo. And the ADOPT study compared the direct factor 10A inhibitor apixaban to placebo in a strategy of extended thromboprophylaxis to see if there was a benefit to risk of such a strategy in preventing VT events. And indeed, much like the inpatient thromboprophylactic strategies, these patient groups were very similar in terms of their inclusion criteria. They had to be over 40 years of age. They had to have an acute medical illness, such as congestive heart failure, respiratory disease, infection, stroke, rheumatic disease, or IBD. And then simply, they had to have additive risk factors for VTE. They were added in a, a, what I call a laundry list type of faction. So, uh, risk factors such as immobility, advanced age, cancer, etc. 
And using this selection criteria, what we saw with all three trials was that the results were disappointing. In the exclaim trial, there was a statistically significant 40% risk reduction, but only after a major protocol amendment that rendered the results of this trial difficult to interpret and difficult to implement in clinical settings. The Magellan trial saw a statistically significant 22% risk reduction, again, favoring the active uh, comparator, but this is much less than the expected 35% risk reduction, and the ENDOP study did not see any statistically significant risk reduction of VTE. But all three studies showed an, anywhere from a two to nearly threefold increased risk of major bleeding and also clinically relevant non-major bleeding as well. So these three large global extended thromboprophylactic trials uh, represented failures uh, of this strategic approach. And we can describe these failures in two ways, not enough benefit and too much harm. But before we uh, urge strategies to minimize harm to patient groups using an extended uh, thromboprophylactic strategy, I think the first order of business is uh, to uh, ascertain uh, risk selection. So the key question in my view is how would we select an at-risk subgroup of this very heterogeneous patient population that would indeed benefit from an extended thromboprophylactic strategy? So this remains the key question to date. And because of these uh, three topics and three issues that I've already discussed, namely the fact that um, thromboprophylaxis does not confer the same risk reduction across the medically ill, the fact that from a VTE perspective, this group appears to be very heterogeneous, and lastly, to some extent, because of the failures of these large phase three extended thromboprophylactic trials, the most recent ninth edition American College of Chest Physician guidelines saw a sea change with respect to how one approached uh, VT risk assessment in the non-surgical patient groups. So for the first time, the ACCP moved away from a group-specific strategy that had advocated that um, it had advocated for for nearly a quarter century to an individualized approach of risk for both VTE and bleeding when assessing a particular patient's thromboprophylactic strategy. And because of this sea change with respect to the international guidelines, what we saw moving forward were, uh, again, key efforts into uh, both developing and validating such a risk, an individualized risk assessment approach. So how does an ideal risk assessment model uh, look like, especially in the medical patient population? Well, an ideal RAM would enable clinicians to accurately identify patients who meet a threshold risk of developing a DVT in the absence of prophylaxis. An ideal RAM should predict the correct risk level, which include both disease-specific as well as predisposing risk factors, depending on the uh, level of evidence, to allow a more tailored thromboprophylactic strategy. It should reliably exclude patients without a beneficial risk-benefit ratio, should be evidence-based and validated, should be methodologically transparent, and lastly, simple to use in clinical practice. Well, I'm a student of history, and suffice to say that the concept of individualized VT risk assessment in medical inpatients is not a new one. And indeed, we saw uh, risk assessment models using scoring systems as uh, 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 as much as almost 15 years ago, such as this model uh, developed by Ludwig Lutz. So this model actually was one of the first models that used a scoring approach and included uh, both exposing or disease-specific risk to assess uh, overall VTE risk uh, in this patient group, such as the presence of heart failure, COPD, infection, stroke, etc., as well as patient level or predisposing risk such as advanced age, the presence of malignancy, personal history or family history of VTE, thrombophilia, et cetera. And what we can appreciate in this model was, again, increasing risk based on an increasing score. And somewhere where the collection of both exposing and predisposing risk combined to uh, place the patient at a threshold level uh, after which uh, they would, in theory, benefit from a pharmacologic thromboprophylactic strategy. 
So this was a very nice conceptual model, and indeed this introduced the concept of a scoring system to assess individualized VT risk in this patient group. However, suffice to say that none of the constructs of this model were evidence-based, and uh, when this threshold risk occurred was uh, uh, truly unknown. Probably the first attempt at an evidence-based VTE risk assessment model was published about 10 years ago by a group of thrombosis experts. And what this group did is looked at the state of the literature at that time and tried to uh, establish an evidence-based approach, both including medical illness or condition, as we see here on the left, and uh, predisposing or patient-specific risk factors, such as we see on the right, which included history of VTE, malignancy, concurrent acute infectious disease, and advanced age. And if patients had any one of these either uh, uh, predisposing or exposing risk factors, then they were eligible for thromboprophylaxis. So I think this was uh, good uh, with respect to uh, the model's urge for an evidence-based approach, but I think we can appreciate a few things. Number one, uh, there was no attempt to either weight or score each of these individual risk factors. Number two, the large majority, especially of uh, predisposing risk factors, were consensus-based, so really not based on ev any evidence approach at all. And number three, um, uh, there was no attempt at uh, performance characteristics of these individualized risk factors to determine how an overall model using this construct would, would look like. But I think, again, very important to note that, um, again, th these kinds of modeling uh, was thought of uh, about 10 years ago. Now, the modern era of a VT risk assessment using clinical models probably started with the publication of the Kucher uh, VTE risk model. And this was published as part of an EHR strategy uh, to, uh, again, uh, initiate electronic alerts so that appropriate prophylaxis was given and, uh, and VT events were reduced. And the Kucher VT risk factor model was, again, one of the first truly scored uh, models. We saw that major risk factors such as cancer, prior VT, and hypercoagulability gave you three points. Intermediate risk factor, uh, which was major surgery, gave you two points. And minor risk factors, which included advanced age, obesity, hormone replacement therapy, or, uh, or immobility, gave you one point. And as for this model, once we reached a score of four, uh, the particular patient required thromboprophylaxis. So I think this model really heralded uh, the era of an individualized and scored and weighted risk assessment approach to this patient group. I think many of us are familiar with the PADA model, and this model represented a refinement over the Kucher model using uh, very similar scoring systems, but also adding uh, 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 exposing factors such as heart respiratory failure, acute myocardial infarction, stroke, and acute infection. And much like the Kucher model, in this model, once a patient reached a score of four, they were eligible for pharmacologic thromboprophylaxis. And in a prospective management study using the PADA risk model, uh, uh, what we saw were high-risk patients that received thromboprophylaxis had the same risk profile as those low-risk patients that did not receive thromboprophylaxis, and uh, uh, an opposite uh, effect, uh, those high-risk patients uh, who did not receive prophylaxis had statistically significant increase in their VTE risk. So I think this is a, an important first management study using a model uh, and an overall management approach. Now one of the interesting things about the Padua risk model and the theme that we'll see uh, over and over is that this model predicted only about 40% of the hospitalized medically ill population uh, was at VTE risk. Now, some of the limitations of the model was that none of the point systems were evidence-derived. There was no um, the performance characteristics done on the model, uh, and there was no uh, C-statistic or uh, discrimination characteristics or calibration characteristics that were also published uh, during the derivation of this model. Perhaps the first evidence-derived model, uh, a RAM model for the medical patient, was the Waller model. And this model uh, was published uh, by a database of over 140,000 medically ill patients. And using logistic regression, 
the final model looked at four significant risk factors, which included prior VTE, bed rest, uh, the presence of a PICC line, and the presence of prior cancer. And I think we can appreciate here that the model showed excellent discrimination uh, with an AUC or area under the curve of about 0.87, uh, meaning the ability to discriminate an outcome of interest, in this case VTE, uh, over uh, uh, over a, a patients that did not have VTE. So this represented, I think, a major step forward uh, in terms of this uh, uh, derivation of the model uh, based on evidence. However, the model the weighted was not scored, and again, it was very difficult to implement in, in clinical practice in a routine form without such a scoring method. Perhaps the first evidence-derived uh, weighted uh, model was the improved model that was published around the same time as the Waller model. Uh, and this model was also weighted and scored unlike uh, previous models, and unlike previous models was based on evidence from the large uh, improved study that I've already introduced. And to derive the risk factors for this model, uh, we used regression estimates to obtain seven clinical risk factors during the course of a patient's hospitalizations that were significantly associated with three-month VTE risk. And we see the clinical risk factors on the left and their hazards ratio on the right. And these included previous VTE with a hazards ratio approaching five, the presence of thrombophilia, current lower limb paralysis, and cancer uh, with a hazards ratio of approximately three, and the presence of immobility, ICU, CCU stay, and advanced age with a hazards ratio approaching two. And based on the strengths of these associations, what we did was assign points for each of the individual risk scores so that previous VTE got you three points, thrombophilia, lower limb paralysis, and cancer two points, and ICU, CCU stay, immobility, and advanced age one point. And I think a nice acronym for the improved model is shown below. And this is something that my wife helped me to, uh, to memorize the uh, model with, which is impact ill. IM stands for immobility. P for previous VTE. A for age over 60. C for cancer. T for thrombophilia. I for ICU stay and CCU stay. And LL for lower limb paralysis. And when we put these scores in the original derivation cohort, we found some very interesting things. So the first thing we found was that the model's overall C statistic was about 0 0.7, which showed a fairly good discrimination characteristics. The other thing we, sh we showed was that the overall symptomatic VT event rate uh, in this population of 15,000 medically ill patients as a whole was about 1%. And this was just at the ACCP uh, mandated threshold of of uh, initiating pharmacologic prophylaxis where the benefits of thromboprophylaxis would, would outweigh the potential risks of bleeding using a pharmacologic thromboprophylactic strategy. So this represented the ACCP threshold of, of uh, an at-risk population. The other thing that we saw with this model uh, was uh, uh, nicely as the score went up, so did the observed VTE uh, go up. So this model had very good calibration characteristics. The last thing we saw was that the model had two natural cut points. A cut point of 0, 01, which by the way defined about 69% of the total patient population, which showed that the score of 1 represented a truly low risk population with an observed VTE rate of about 0.5%. On the other hand, the model also saw a natural cut point with a score of four, which represented truly a high-risk patient population from the VT perspective, where the overall VT symptomatic event rate was close to 4%. And this represented about 7% of the patient population. And then the other 25% of the patient population had a, an improved score of two to three, which was just at the threshold risk of uh, mandating a, a, a pharmacologic thromboprophylactic strategy using ACCP criteria. Now we all know that it's one thing to uh, derive uh, a risk model. It's a very different thing to externally validate this model in other patient populations and this represents a very difficult and laborious uh, uh, work. So 
how has the external validation uh, uh, been done uh, using the various models that I suggested in medical in, in patients? As I mentioned, there are actually four steps in the validation of any clinical prediction rule, and this has really been nicely stated uh, by my chair of medicine here at Northwell, Tom McGinn, uh, and of which the derivation only uh, identifies the initial step of identifying the factors with predictive power. The validation steps include both a narrow and a broad validation uh, in that the rule should be applied in multiple clinical settings in the broad validation category with varying prevalence and outcomes of disease. And once such a narrow and broad validation is undergone, then the final step would include impact analysis uh, where we see evidence that this specific rule would change uh, both physician phys uh, behavior and improve patient outcomes. Now the Padua VT risk score uh, was externally validated in another European population although a relatively small population of about 2,000 patients. I won't talk about the Geneva risk score. This is a separate risk score, but I'd like to draw your attention to the right side of this slide, looking at the pattern prediction score. And I think we can appreciate that, in general, increasing score predicted increasing VTE risk, although not in a clean fashion. But I think what's very important with the PATA risk score was that this risk score had an excellent negative predictive value of almost 99%, uh, meaning that uh, for patients who had a score less than four, uh, uh, the model had uh, very good uh, sensitivity in, in, uh, in uh, predicting those at low risk of disease. But perhaps the most uh, validated model in terms of an external validation process is the improved uh, model that I showed you earlier. This model has been validated in two external populations of about 20,000 patients each. The Valor study validated the model in the Hamilton Health Science uh, Center Area Hospitals as part of McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, and also we also validated the model in our own North Shore LIJ health system. And this model showed good to excellent discrimination characteristics. Uh, with an area under the curve of 0.77 and about 0.70 respectively. And there have been two further uh, validation efforts uh, in validating the improved score as part of the Magellan database, which was an international database, and also part of the uh, uh, Michigan Hospital Consortium group of over 60,000 patients. Now these were less optimistic AUCs of about 0.6, but this is likely because not all of the seven clinical risk factors uh, could have been ascertained for the purposes of uh, the, the other two validation approaches. So what we have to date of the improved model is that uh, this has gone through broad external validation in nearly 110,000 medically ill patients across a variety of health settings. So this represents truly the most broadly validated risk assessment model in this population. The other part of the uh, improved RAM validation is model calibration. And in the VT Valor study that I already mentioned, what we saw here uh, was that the uh, Valor uh, validation population closely mirrored the original derivation population. So those patients uh, with a score of 0 to 1 were truly low risk from a VT perspective uh, with a VT rate of about 0.2%. And this also, by the way, represented about two-thirds of the entire medically ill population, much like we saw in the derivation cohort. Patients with a score of two or three uh, in the Valor study had a VT point estimate of 1%, uh, which just, uh, again, started the ACCP threshold for recommending a pharmacologic approach to VT prevention. And much like the derivation cohort, this represented approximately 25 to of the patient population. And lastly, uh, in the Valor study, once one had an improved score four or more, they were truly at high risk of disease with a symptomatic event rate of over 4%, again, closely mirroring uh, the event rate in the derivation population. So what we could say from this model was about two-thirds of the acutely ill medical population was at low risk of disease, uh, and uh, conversely, about 5 to 10% of patients were at very high risk of disease. 
also in a separate uh, calibration effort uh, as part of the North Shore LIJ health system validation effort, if we were to use a binary approach, then uh, we could use an improved score of three, which uh, again uh, predicted a threefold increased risk uh, of events over the low risk patient population. So where are we now in 2016 with respect to state of the art of all the VTRAMs in this uh, heterogeneous uh, patient group? Well, a nice systematic review uh, using a validated uh, quality checklist of risk assessment models, namely the Downs and Black checklist, six models were given a category one status, which meant that they were appropriately evidence derived and had appropriate performance characteristics done on them, including appropriate discrimination uh, calibration. And these included the Waller model and our own improved model. Important to note that these were the only two models in the general uh, medical patient population. The other four models uh, included uh, very specialized groups of patients. And also importantly, all of the generalized VT ramps uh, in the medically ill patient group all had uh, significant uh, factors uh, which included advanced age, prior VTE, known thrombophilia, active or prior cancer. That's an important point is that the presence of cancer, especially in the five years, has very similar strength of association uh, with the, uh, to active cancer and uh, being able to predict risk of, uh, of VTE events, bed rest and mobility, and current lower limb paralysis. So the models are very similar in which uh, risk factors were independently associated with VT risk in this population. Now, I think what we have learned now from all of these VT risk assessment schemes uh, is shown in this slide. And this slide represents what I'd like to call a double trouble for this patient population. What we see here, both in the derivation, but also importantly in the validation populations, is consistently the models predict only about 30 to 40 percent of medically ill patients are at risk for VTE. And all the models had excellent negative predictive value, which likely means we are over prophylaxing anywhere from 50, 60, upwards to 70 percent of, uh, of patients using a universal, non-individualized thrombophilactic prophylactic such as is currently used in U.S. hospital health systems. Conversely, uh, depending on what cut point one uses uh, for which model, usually cut points of three or, or four or more, uh, there's about a 5 to 10 percent group of patients uh, that have very high risk of disease, over 3 or 4 percent. And likely, these patients would benefit either from a multimodal trauma prophylactic strategy or an extended trauma prophylactic strategy, something that is not routinely being done, as we see uh, from large databases. So what we're doing at present, at least in U.S. health systems, is likely over-prophylaxing about 60 to 70 percent of low-risk patients and conversely under-prophylaxing uh, 10 percent of very high-risk patients by not giving them an out-of-hospital or even extended thromoprophylactic approach using pharmacologic agents. And that's a, an important note and that's something that we have seen consistently from all of these models. Now, where we may be in, in the coming years is a truly personalized or individualized uh, VTE and bleed risk approach to these patients. So this is um, one such model in development. This is the URL for the improved risk calculator. We see here the seven independent VT risk factors on the left and something I didn't go to uh, through today, but the 11 independent bleeding risk factors that we saw in the improved bleed risk model that we are currently validating. And what's very nice for the hospitalist or inpatient physician is that one can simply start checking off each of the VTE and bleeding risk factors and getting the probability of a symptomatic VT event or probability of either major clinically important bleeding event. And then at the bedside, determine an individual patient's thromboprophylactic strategy. I think to me this represents um, the most exciting development with respect to a personalized approach for VT prevention, especially in this very heterogeneous uh, patient group. Now, I think the uh, last topic that deserves mention 
is the use of biomarkers in VT risk assessment, especially how it pertains to the medically ill patient population. We had data as far back as the MedNOC study published in 1999, but more importantly, more recently, in the Magellan trial, that over 74 patients in Magellan had D-dimer levels above the upper limit of normal, and nearly half of all patients had D-dimers that were greater than two times the upper limit of normal uh, using a central lab. And using a cut point of two times the upper limit of normal uh, for D-dimers gave us something, I think, very interesting. So those patients uh, in both cohorts in Magellan, either in the active arm or in the placebo arm, had anywhere from a two to nearly four-fold increased risk of VTE when they had their uh, D-dimers greater than two times the upper limit of normal. And I think very interestingly, uh, the same patient groups were not at increased risk of either major or non-major clinically relevant bleeding. So this D-dimer using a cutoff of two times the upper limit of normal was for the first time able to predict a net clinical benefit in these patient groups. And this is something we have not had before because as many of us know, the same independent risk factors that predict thrombotic risk in a patient are very similar to uh, or identical to uh, risk factors that would predict bleed risk in, in patient groups. So this is, I think, a very interesting, very novel, and uh, very important um, uh, observation. The other aspect of the, the D-dimer as VT biomarker was that the results were robust whether they were done during the early phases of a patient's hospitalization, day one, or further on in their hospitalization at day 10, although there was some loss of sensitivity when they were done later on uh, because of the interference of uh, thromboprophylaxis. And lastly, in a separate study, we saw that D-dimers were also able to predict intermediate VT risk in the congestive heart failure uh, subgroup of patients by about day 35. So uh, again, re results were robust, not just for the overall Magellan pro uh, population, but in important subgroups of patients. The other aspect about D-dimers that we can see is that with respect to their strength of association, uh, the D-dimer, given an odds ratio of about two, had a very similar strength of association as, as active cancer which we know is a strongly associated with VTE risk and just under history of VTE and recent major surgery, which are major VTE risk factors in, uh, in determining uh, uh, VTE risk in, in, in this particular patient. So again, uh, a fairly strong association with VTE risk. And lastly, from Magellan, looking at the uh, ROC area under the curves of about 0.68 and 0.73, we showed that the uh, D-dimer either in and of itself or as part of a, a clinical risk model uh, would, in theory, have a very good uh, uh, discrimination uh, with respect to, uh, uh, again, assessing uh, patients at, at risk of disease. Now, another biomarker that is, uh, in my view, not quite ready for prime time was the uh, NT-proBNP, and this is a separate analysis as part of a sub-study within Magellan in the congestive heart failure population that we saw very elevated NT-proBNPs uh, in the fourth quartile or greater were able to predict both symptomatic uh, venous thromobolic events as well as cardiovascular death. But uh, again, this is very early on, but I'd like to introduce you to all the available uh, biomarker data with respect to uh, uh, risk assessment of the TE. So given all the constructs that I just discussed with you today, I think we truly are entering a new era for venous thromboembolic prevention in medical inpatients. And this is a nice uh, editorial done out of Italy that showed moving forward uh, what we should be doing with respect to VT prevention is we should be focusing our efforts really in the post-hospital discharge setting and giving patients appropriate duration to maximize uh, risk benefit of any thromboprophylactic strategy. But importantly, uh, we should have appropriate patient selection uh, from a VT risk perspective based on both disease and patient-specific VT risk factors to truly define high-risk subgroups which means that we should use an evidence-derived and validated VTE risk score, such as the improved score that I showed you, which is at this point the, uh, the model with the uh, widest external validation, and potentially the use of biomarkers such as the D-dimer, and I've already shown you the data. 
And lastly, we should temper this approach with some type of risk assessment of a patient's bleeding risk. And I already mentioned the potential of using an, uh, a bleed score such as the improved bleed score, which is currently undergoing external validation. So using these constructs, where are we with respect to the next phase of VT prevention trials uh, in the medically ill population? Well, we know that the APEX trial is recently closed. This is a very large trial of over 6,800 patients looking at a strategy of extended thromboprophylaxis with the oral factor 10A inhibitor batrixaban uh, and using a dose-adapted approach uh, based on renal function. And in this study, for the first time, elevated D-dimers were used to risk stratify patients and, uh, and uh, again, identify uh, that patient group using a D-dimer-based approach that likely would benefit from an extended thromboprophylactic strategy. But in my view, perhaps the most innovative trial design is the Mariner uh, trial design, and I'm very privileged, along with Dr. Uh, Gary Raskop, to be co-chairs of the executive committee for this trial. And this likely, uh, when it is uh, completed, will be the largest single study of VT prevention in this patient population. Uh, this study uh, uses, uh, again, the oral direct factor 10A inhibitor of veroxaban, again, in the, an adapted uh, design based on renal function, so 10 milligrams for those patients with creatinine clearances over 50, 7.5 milligrams for those patients with creatinine clearances of 30 to 50, uh, uh, stratified based on renal function and compared to placebo. And I think what's uh, interesting about this trial is, number one, the extended duration of thromboprophylaxis up to 45 days, uh, which uh, is at the end of a uh, study period, which really maximizes the duration of thromboprophylaxis and mirrors what we saw in epidemiologic studies. But I think also importantly, for the first time, uh, this trial is using an embedded clinical risk tool, namely the IMPROVES tool, as well as elevated D-dimers to truly identify high-risk patients that likely would benefit from an extended thromboprophylactic strategy. So this, for the first time, in my view, uh, would be a proof of concept of whether we can use a clinical risk assessment model to truly identify patients at high enough risk for VT that would benefit from such a strategy. So how do we conclude, and what do we conclude? Well, we know that the hospitalized medical patient population is very heterogeneous with regards to VTE risk. And we also know that the use of thromboprophylaxis does not confer the same risk reduction across patient groups. So trials of extended thromboprophylaxis in this population did not show a favorable risk-benefit profile without a formalized VT risk assessment strategy. And for the first time, the most recent ninth edition American College of Chest Physician Antithrombotic Guidelines called for an individualized approach of VT risk for an appropriate thromboprophylactic strategy at a patient level. There have been major efforts in both deriving and importantly validating clinical VTE risk tools, also using biomarkers such as the D-dimer and selecting high VTE risk patient groups uh, in this population that likely would benefit from thromboprophylaxis. At this point, I've showed you that the improved VTRAM has been broadly and extensively validated, and also the biomarker D-dimer using a cut point of greater than two times the upper limit of normal has also shown great promise in potentially identifying high VT risk cohorts with uh, good benefit to risk profiles uh, with respect to thromboprophylaxis. I think importantly, all of the risk models suggest that over 60 to 70 percent of medical patients are at low risk of VTE, and we are likely over-prophylaxing about 60 to 70 percent of our acutely ill hospitalized medical patient population when using a threshold risk of 1 percent as, uh, as suggested by the ACCP guidelines. Uh, and this is using a universal thromboprophylactic strategy such as uh, used and present across U.S. hospital systems. We also know that likely about 10 to 20 percent of these patient groups are at high risk of disease, which likely would need better efforts at either multimodal or out-of-hospital or extended thromboprophylactic strategies. 
And the last point I'd like to make is that recent global randomized trials of extended thromboprophylaxis, which include the APEX trial and the ongoing MARINER trial, have incorporated these new concepts, namely the use of a clinical risk model and a biomarker, such as the D-dimer, with respect to selecting high-risk groups. And these uh, global trials, in my view, uh, would truly become proof of concept of whether these clinical VT risk models with or without biomarkers can select high-risk patients that would benefit from extended thromboprophylactic strategies. So I hope to have engendered at least some thought within this field. I thank you very much for your attention uh, and hope we are all on the path to VT enlightenment. So with this, Dr. Raskob, I'll be done and um, uh, open up, up to questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spiropoulos, for a very thorough, um, up-to-date, evidence-based, and engaging presentation. Now um, we will shift to the question and answer section of this webinar. We would like to submit a written question for Dr. Spiropoulos. Please use the questions area of your toolbar. And um, we do have a couple questions here. And so I'll, I'll start with the first one. Regarding um, the risk assessment models of VTE and the risk factors used in those, what was the definition of known thrombophilia that was used? So, so that's a good question. And the first part of that is that the thrombophilia had to be known. So the patient came in uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with thrombophilia as part of their ICD-9 or medical history criteria. And these included both the uh, standard um, thrombophilic markers such as the deficiency states, protein C, protein S, antithrombin uh, deficiency states, as well as the, uh, the genetic thrombophilic states including factor V Leiden and the prothrombin gene mutation, and lastly included uh, the uh, the patients with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, a second question here really um, relates uh, D-dimers, and I think judging by the question, I think we maybe you can expand even on a little bit more about this, Dr. Spiropoulos, but first of all, um, when should the D-dimer be tested in this context of risk assessment? And then you know, how does the use of D-dimer in this risk assessment contrast from its use in, in other roles of care of VT diagnosis or long-term therapy? I, mean, I think that's a very good question. And uh, as we both know, this is um, a question that, that comes up quite frequently anytime uh, uh, a laboratory marker is used in a new context. So up until now, we have used D-dimers as a diagnostic tool with respect to VTE, both to rule out disease initially and also uh, to predict those patients who uh, with negative D-dimers may be at low risk for recurrence. In the setting of the, using D-dimer for the purposes of uh, using it in a new context, namely as a biomarker, we're actually looking at elevations of D-dimer. Uh, and these elevations from the best of our knowledge should be two times the upper limit of normal based on local lab criteria. So uh, again, we think that an elevated D-dimer uh, as, as part of, of a biomarker-based strategy would identify a patient who then later uh, would be at risk of developing disease within usually about 90 days. What we also know is that the earlier you get this D-dimer, such as during uh, the uh, uh, index admission uh, very early on, if not the first day, might give you slightly better sensitivity than later during the hospitalization, after which maybe a pharmacologic agent such as heparin uh, or loam liquid heparin may dampen, uh, it dampen the uh, abilities of D-dimer uh, to be predictive in the setting, although, as I mentioned, the results were still robust whether the D-dimer was obtained uh, at day zero during admission upwards up to day 10 far along during their hospitalization. Now, suffice to say that this is a fairly new concept. In my view, um, this is not ready to be used uh, in, in a prime time condition. I think the results of both Apex and Mariner that have incorporated this concept within the trial design will be very helpful in assessing whether this approach uh, really works 
in identifying high-risk patient groups. So I think we should just simply wait for the results uh, of APEX, which uh, we know are forthcoming in the next few months, and likely also wait for the results of Mariner before we incorporate this into our uh, routine clinical practice. Great, Tom. And just to follow on on that with the D-dimer, um, and our audience here is uh, very in tune with some of the cutting edge efforts. How does the age-adjusted uh, D-dimer influence its role in the biomarker setting of uh, risk assessment? Well, that's an excellent question. And much like the uh, age-adjusted approach that more and more uh, uh, thrombosis experts are advocating uh, for its use as a diagnostic tool with respect to predicting those patients at risk of recurrent disease, we also know that, of course, D-dimers uh, which likely herald an, uh, what I like to call an inflamed uh, vascular system, uh, for, for a better word, uh, likely herald uh, or, or do increase uh, with age. Uh, what we think is once we start using the, a cut point of, of uh, two times the upper limit of normal, then the age effect, uh, I think, um, is less important than the upper limits of the cut point in terms of, of the positive predictive value of, of D-dimer in predicting those patients who are at risk. So remember, we're using the D-dimers in two different ways. In, in a diagnostic setting, we're looking at its negative predictive value, but in a biomarker setting, we're looking at its positive predictive value. So we do think if we use such a cut point as two times that upper limit of normal, uh, at, at this point, we think that uh, it should capture all of the age-related aspects of, of elevated D-dimers. Thank you. Um, I, we just have the time, I think, for one or two more brief questions here, and I think there are some important practical ones coming. So you gave a very nice overview of the evidence, um, and, and of course, um, you know, there are some gaps. But given the current status of the evidence, and you as a clinician who has to make decisions in some of these patients, at the present situation, who would you, wh what kind of patient would you choose to prescribe extended thromboprophylaxis in, in a medical patient leaving hospital? Well, I think it's a, that's a very good question. And, and the first thing that I'd like to say is that uh, all of uh, all the patients should really receive what I call an adequate course of thromboprophylaxis based on the evidence from the initial inpatient trial. So we know that these patients, in order to maximize the appropriate duration of, of thromboprophylaxis, should get their prophylaxis for at least seven, if not uh, 14 days. So in my view, any of your uh, hospitalized medical patient population, if they're leaving the hospital at four days, should probably get another five, six days worth of heparin prophylaxis. Now I know that's not done routinely, uh, but that's something should be, that should be considered. The, the other aspect that I'd like to do is, is more and more, uh, in my practice, I'm actually using the improved tool, especially in patients with a score of four or more, uh, and, and especially if they have other risk factors, um, and using my clinical judgment to say maybe we should be uh, prophylaxing these patients closer to the two-week mark uh, than at present, which is really just four or five days. So, so at the very least, in those patients that who we think would benefit from prophylaxis, it makes no sense to subject them to all the harms of prophylaxis for four days and then stop therapy at, at hospital discharge, uh, because then you've really made very little gain uh, and uh, you've really dampened any of the treatment effects. And what you've given that patient is now risk of VTE in the post-hospital discharge setting. The last question, um, and this is it's an interesting one. I mean, you can see why, why it would be there given you've said heparin, and that means injection on an outpatient basis. Is there any role for warfarin um, in medical patients for extended prophylaxis? No, so there's no uh, evidence, especially of a lower intensity use of, of warfarin, you know, uh, such as an INR range of 1.5 to 2 that, that we know uh, from extended uh, or, or, or from secondary thromboprophylactic uh, studies. But there's no evidence that either the conventional um, approach or a lower intensity approach would confer uh, um, a good benefit to risk ratio. Because remember, there is bleed risk associated with warfarin. And remember, what we're trying to do is prevent VTE. So at this point, we really have no evidence in, um, in assigning uh, warfarin as a primary thromboprophylactic agent in this population. Now, if they have a secondary reason for why they're in warfarin, such as an arterial indication, AF indication, of course, 
um, that would uh, protect them from a, a, a VTE perspective as well. Excellent. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time, so I'm going to um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sparopoulos, for a terrific webinar presentation today. Um, and um, I want to also thank all of our audience for joining. Um, and um, we especially want to thank um, the National Blood Clot Alliance for hosting today's webinar. Um, and if you do have comments, questions about today's presentation, please, please contact Cynthia Sayers at csayers at cdc.gov. Uh, this webinar will be archived and the content will soon be available at the CDC's Division of Blood Disorders website as um, shown on the slide just prior. Um, and you just go back, yes, and I'll, it gives me a chance just to again underscore our appreciation to the National Blood Clot Alliance and to our colleagues there for the great work they do in, in helping to increase awareness of thrombosis. Um, and here's where you can um, contact the archive webinar. And in response to a couple questions I did receive about this, the slides will be there on that website. Um, if we go to the final slide then, please. Uh, please be sure to join us again next month, April 21st, at this same time when Dr. Maggie Rodney from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center will present on update on treatment of hepatitis C infection in people with hemophilia. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, CDC, for, for this and, and National